for the riders competing, of course their main focus is on their riding and on their horses. So, Stefan, thank you for being here today. Um, your ride yesterday was, it was beautiful. It was so inspiring to watch you. Yeah, I always admire your riding, the softness that you ride with, and of course Mopsies is just amazing. Um, what were some of the highlights for you from yesterday's ride? Well, Lydia, first of all, thanks for having me. It's always fun to join a good, enthusiastic group. Um, Mopsy was great, you know, just the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold. It's with him a really, really fine balance to have him excited enough for the trot work, for the half passes, the half passage, but on the flip side also relaxed enough for the walk, the collected walk, the halls and the rain back. That's not necessarily how it always was with Mopsy. <laughs> so I consider that quite a, quite a luxury to have that available yeah. now. You know, you can wake him up, but you can certainly chill him out. And everything worked out great, a clean test, that right period got a little bit away from me got a little bit big, but other than that, a clean test, and honestly, to be in the neighborhood of the, the Germans and the Danish, you know, a really good company to be in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I was, I was watching some of the warm-up, and that must be kind of hard to be like warming up there in the middle of all the vendors with everyone watching. So kind of what's your warm-up routine and also mentally how do you prepare for a big event, a big show like this? Very good questions. I think when you have a warm-up like this that's already a little bit electric, I think it's more fair for the horses to get used to this yeah. and then enter the show arena. In fact, yesterday morning, um, and even during the warm-up, there were some kids from a kindergarten, yeah. and they were reaching out to Mopsy, and you know, so, so that is great. You know, it's honestly I prefer it that way. It's already a little bit electric in the warm-up, and I'm so uh, appreciative to the organizers that they allow people to come in without tickets and watch the warm-up. Yes. As far as your second question, mentally preparing, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that I did my very best preparing myself, physically, mentally. Um, I prepared Mopsy with the utmost kindness. Yes. And I knew I put myself in a position to do my very best. And because of that, Emilia, I 100% had to be okay with the outcome. Yes. And um, it worked out actually better than I expected. So, you know, great. But even if it wouldn't have, I would have been 100% okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, I love, I love hearing that. And that's important for all of us to remember, which is that, you know, leading up to the competition, you want to prepare yourself and your horse as best as possible. But at the end of the day, there are horses and they're unpredictable and stuff can happen. And like Stefan has said, you have to be proud of you, the way you prepared yourself and not base that necessarily on just the outcome. Um, so when you talk about like your mental preparation, do you visualize your test or kind of how do you mentally prepare for a competition? Yeah, visualizing, but uh, to a level that um, it's hard to explain because I know what that arena feels like, I know what it smells like. I don't just visualize the, the lines, I visualize the, the view that I have from Mopsy. You know, going from the first center line for the first turn to the extension and so on. And um, I really feel and think that you create certain neural pathways in your, yes. in your brain. Yes. And so that you're somewhat prepared. When you go into the ring, you're, you set up for a really, really good experience. <laughs> And um, so visualizing, yes, but it's at a pretty different level. <laughs> yeah, so we all can learn from that. And you know, when we all should be visualizing your test before you go to the ring, like Stefan said, and it's more than just like A down center line, X halt salute. It's like, what's the view? What's the feeling in your horse? And that's... Yeah. 
And one more thing, honestly, when I visualize it, sometimes I even put a very, very strong emotion into that. So goals and dreams are wonderful, but sometimes even having that emotion as if that went already really well. You know, I have lines already set up, what I might say to the press if it works really well. You know? <laughs> <All right. laughs> and even if it doesn't, you know, I might have something that I'm prepared for, but I'm doing everything in my brain to create a network for success. Yeah, awesome, I love to hear that. And so what happens, like, let's say that you have a mistake in your test, how do you mentally recover from that and keep going? You know, you, you honestly learn to put it aside. You know, you keep going with the, with the test, make the best, maybe risk it the next movement a little bit more. If there's a canter extension that comes up, maybe we go a little bit more on the throttle because of that mistake before. You know, so, uh, but yeah, you learn 100% that it doesn't affect you at that moment. It might affect you when you get done. <laughs> but at that moment, no. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to ask you about Ravel. So 2009, you won the World Cup on Ravel. Can you tell us a little bit? So tell us what made Ravel so special. If, if I get through this question without getting emotional, it'll be the first time. <laughs> so that's 2009, you know, just, uh, incredible experience just like Moxie you know such a wonderful kind horse so willing to do it you know both horses I swear I never ever had to push them for an extension it's always a little bit a little bit less not too much and um, you know interesting story from Las Vegas uh, it was sponsored by Rolex and I received a man's watch on the first night winning the Grand Prix and on the second night when Ravel won, they said, listen, we expected Isabel or Anki to win, we don't. <laughs> we, we don't have a men's watch, we only have a watch. We have a ladies watch. I said, that's great, give it to my wife. <laughs> but um, what an amazing experience. I remember when the freestyle is done, the organizers ask you to stay in the arena until the score is announced. And um, when I saw that number one popping up, it was pretty cool. Yeah, but I mean, that's like the culmination. You rode Ravel for many years and it, you know, I think with every horse, there's some things that you have to overcome. Can you talk a little bit about what he was like when he was younger and how you like believed in him and overcame that to get to that point? Yeah, of course, both horses, Mopsy and Ravel, both started with a 67, 68%. And um, both have ridden, Mopsy was 79, uh, Ravel over 80%. And um, it doesn't always start that way, of course, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you, like I said before, you have to have a clear vision and there will be disappointments, but the million dollar question is, how long do you hold on to those disappointments? How, long, how quickly can you say, hey, that's done, you know, let's learn from it, move forward, and I'd be the first to admit that I'd be the, the biggest hypocrite you know, when I look back. Right now, that's how I'm thinking. That's, it was a learning procedure, and um, yeah, you get used to doing it really well, and then the disappointments can hurt, especially when it's a team competition and you made a mistake that might affect the team place. It didn't, but I'm just saying, if it did. You know, that's why, you know, the, um, the moment in Tokyo when we had that silver medal was just unbelievable. That's something I honestly can't put in words. That was so incredible. At that time, in the area, we knew that every horse had to go in, first of all, without a mistake, but all three of us had to ride full throttle. 
So you couldn't just say, let's be safe there. We had to go. That was the difference between getting a silver medal and being in fourth place. That's how close it was. There was never a moment there where we had to strategize or talk about it. We all knew, all three of us knew, including Debbie, what had to be done. And all three horses and riders did that. In fact, the US was the only team in Tokyo that didn't make a mistake. So that was pretty amazing. Wow. Okay, so to change the topic a little, you may not remember this, but maybe it was probably like 10 years ago. I brought my horse Trump down for a lesson with Stefan. Trump wasn't the easiest horse. He was a half thoroughbred and he was he kind of wanted to be stiff and tense and so I rode a few times around and stuff and I was like, okay, get off. And he, he got on Trump. He, okay, he didn't say it like that, sorry. But he got on Trump and he rode Trump around for like 20 minutes and he was like, okay, get back on. And Trump was like a different horse. Like I never felt him so soft and so supple and so engaged and so through. And I definitely left that experience thinking, okay, I don't need a new saddle or a need new horse. I have to ride better. I have to ride like Stefan. So how do you, you know, like what's your secret? How do you, how do you do that to Trump? <laughs> I'm happy to share all my secrets there. <laughs> but um, the way I look at it, when I get a horse, when I look at a horse, everybody can see the, the confirmation, uh, the talent in all three gates, but what we often forget is a horse comes with um, either natural self-carriage or it doesn't. I've ridden so many horses that are built beautifully uphill, have an amazing hind leg, but are not quite supple enough and naturally not enough in self-carriage. So when, to be honest, I don't quite remember. <laughs> so it wasn't that bad. So, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> so um, when, when I get on a horse, honestly, I look for um, a steady, but the lightest contact possible. If that means briefly in the beginning, I have a little bit of expression, a little bit less expression, a little bit less engagement, but I have the horse's mind so that the horse is comfortable with my aids and is accepting my aids at any time, 100%. Yeah. I'm in good shape. Then I can look uh, or can listen to my trainer and say, hey, now a little bit more expression, yeah. now a little bit more forward, because now I can be in charge of this. Or if the judges tell me I need to risk it there a little bit more, a little bit steeper half past, the piaf a little bit more in place, I mean, I'd love to have the horses so rideable yeah. that I can do this. Yeah. It is so easy for a trainer to say more forward, more forward. But what if I can control this energy? Yeah. What if the what if the energy works against me? Yeah. Yeah. And what if the horse is not supple enough to do a steeper half pass? Yeah. <coughs> so the suppleness, the self carriage first, and then when a horse is light enough in the contact, and now I'm allowing the horse to step a little bit more into the bridle. <coughs> since it's up to me to allow this then I'm perfectly fine with that. I never quite understood, I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I never quite understood to, to push a horse into the bridle no matter what. Yeah. Yeah? Then we might get more expression, we might get a briefly a little bit more hind leg, but what about the mouth? Yeah. What about the brain, the horse? Yeah. Yeah? We talk so much about engaging the horse's hind legs. I'd love to engage that brain first. And if that means in the beginning I need to do some halts, some rain backs, some walk, half passes. Yeah. If my horse is supple enough in walk, then I'll take this to the trot and the canter. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's as far as the contact, as far as the, the reaction to the leg. I, I allow my horses to screw up. Yeah. And I prepare a canter period and they break to the trot. I make my point, I don't make a big deal, but I say, hey, just because my legs are quiet on your side, that doesn't mean we need to break to the lower gate. Yeah. So they might break five times, yeah, but by the sixth time they say, okay, this very little leg pressure is enough to maintain the connection. Yeah. Nothing different going from a trot or passage to the PF. Yeah. I refuse to tell my horse, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. If they quit, I make quickly my point, very respectfully, yeah. so that they learn. Every mistake is a training opportunity 
and that's how I like to write. Yeah, and, and I think for those of you guys that got a sticker of the training scale, that's a lot what you're talking about is the basics, rhythm, suppleness, and connection. And when you have the basics, then that's what allows you to do the Grand Prix and to ride the complicated movements, but you're always going back and making sure the basics are there before building up again. And one thing I know you teach a lot, which you just alluded to, is Simplicity, like you always say that in your lessons, like it has to be simple, it can't be complicated. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, for sure. I mean, it gets complicated enough in the Grand Prix arena, more complicated in the Grand Prix special, and honestly, more complicated in the freestyle. Yeah. Now you have to not just think about the the placement of the movements; you have to think about the timing of the music. Yeah, so. <coughs> Definitely um, very, very complicated. That's why, uh, again, my horse has to be so rideable yeah. that I can ride the movements with accuracy. Yeah. You know, when I hear a lot of trainers say you got to go more into the corners, yeah, for sure, but is it possible yeah. to ride that deep into the corners? Is it possible to prepare the extensions and the half passes, such, yeah. you know? So, Again, if something is a little bit more complicated in trot, I'd like to take a step back, do it in walk. Yeah. Nothing wrong with walk, walk half passes. Yeah. And to the point where we can really, in a, let's say in a right half pass, that we can ease up with the left leg, not taking the leg completely away, but easing up, and still expecting the horse to do two, three steps by themselves. Yeah. So that they say, wait a second, if I, if I do it, I'm almost being rewarded with a tiny bit of more passive aid, right? And I find it so fascinating how horses can learn. Yeah. yeah. Another example is with Bobsy. You probably saw it yesterday. The rain back is not his most favorite thing. <laughs> so I, what I taught him, and he's on a loose rein, not even on the bit, when I tip a little forward and I cluck with my tongue and I close my thigh, because of that, he goes rain back. Yeah, so completely out of the box, keeping it so simple and natural so that he is more comfortable with it when I put him on the bit in the show ring, you know? And uh, Bob's I'm being very open about this, Bob's has a little bit of a shiver in his left hind, so the rain bag is always more challenging for horses like that. Interesting. Very interesting. It's so fun to hear like your perspective and, and I think it's really important for all of us to hear, you know, of course Stefan's at a very different level than we are, but it still is back to these basics and getting making it clear and always working on getting a response from the smallest aid possible. And that's something that never ends. Like you're always working on that. Um, so two more questions if you have time. Um, Fitness-wise, what do you do out of the saddle so that when you get in the saddle, you're able to have such a nice position? Well, thank you for that, first of all. Um, <laughs> I swim every morning, and it's not always just looking at the clock. Sometimes um, it's a minimum of 250 meters, 10 laps. Um, sometimes it's five laps, 10 laps, taking a minute of a break, you know, getting my heart rate down, respiratory, Way down, then another ten laps, and it's 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 an exercise that I enjoy. I I mean, going to the gym, lifting some weights, yeah, I do that too, but I don't enjoy it. <laughs> Swimming, I really enjoy, and um, the neat thing is about swimming. It brings me a little bit also in a bit of a meditative state of mind because it turns out that you can't breathe underwater. <laughs> so. so you know, in, in a freestyle, you basically breathe in, being above the water, breathing out underneath the water. So it's a very consistent way of breathing. And I watch that also very carefully when I take the break. Yeah. Usually for a minute, I take about 25 breaths and just focus on that, nothing else. Yeah. That took some time. Yeah. That took some time to shut this off and giving it a break. I, I had to learn the hard way. I'd be the first one to admit that. But um, so physically and mentally, that's a very good exercise for me. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, some, some work with weights, especially core muscles for sure. And then just three months ago, I started um, to go to a company called Stretch Lab. And what they do, they um, stretch your, you know, all your body parts and yeah. um, they tell you, said, look, um, how far can we go? So you can tell them, okay, that's enough. You take a deep breath and then you go a tiny bit more instead of just, you know, going in there where you kind of work against the therapist. Yeah. And to, again, to me, a very, very great way to relax. Yeah, cool. And does so does like you were talking about the breathing with the swimming, does that do you breathe also when you're riding? Like does that help you with your breathing when you're in the saddle? Yeah, I, I try to remember that, but um, <laughs> especially especially in the walk break and thank God Mopsy is in so much self care and wants to go it, yeah. it doesn't take a huge cardiovascular effort, you know. But um, <laughs> But in, in general, I would say yes, um, breathing, you know, a pretty significant tool, something that didn't, um, yeah, of course it didn't work, but I mean for relaxation, yeah. I have to say it didn't work for me for the longest time. Yeah. Like meditation, it took me forever, you know, sitting still and allowing that brain to slow down and without another thought popping in there. You know, and nowadays when it, you ask me about mental preparation and nervousness, you know, of course I get nervous. Yeah, but I'm observing it a little bit more and say, look, you know, you've been competing for 50 years, and nobody has taught me to be nervous. I'm the only one who's taught myself to be that way. So that also makes me believe that I can unteach this. Yeah. yeah? So now, yesterday, I said, yeah, heart rate is up. A little bit excited for sure. And I'm just observing it and allowing it. Yeah. You know, Amelia, I try to fight it so much and hiding from it, crazy workouts, you know, and the, the time when I felt like, you know, accepting it, saying this is part of it, you know, not embracing because that's a little too far, but just just accepting it, accommodating it, and I say, look, I know you want to be nervous, but my mind is calm. So, you know, and slowly my body is adapting to this, yeah. you know, but that took at least the last three years to practice this very mindfully, yeah? and I was very open about anxiety, and to me there's a big difference between nervous and being anxious, to me anxiety is when your body and your mind simply doesn't want to slow down. Yeah. Sleeping was a huge issue uh, even five years ago. Uh, before a major competition, so I just watched YouTube clips all night long, which is <laughs> definitely something you don't want to do. <laughs> but um, it was a really, really long process, and the first year I honestly didn't see any results. It took forever, and now when I wake up, um, it's okay. I read a wonderful book, it's called um, Saying Goodnight to Insomnia. <laughs> and, you know, the author talks about the book and says, uh, nobody's sleeper is broken. You know, and we get so worried about looking at the alarm clock, just not sleeping enough, uh, tomorrow's a big day, you're not getting enough sleep, and we worry about it, you know, and I've honestly had plenty of good competitions where I slept two, three hours, and it, and it worked out, you know, so, um, it's, you know, on, and on top of that, adrenaline is a beautiful yeah. thing. <laughs> Well, it's definitely very humbling to know that you get nervous too, and that's something that we all, you know, we all struggle with in figuring out how to like channel it into having a, a good performance, to enhancing your performance, and kind of, like you said, being mindful of it, but then like taking your nerves with you and okay, let's go have some fun and ride better. So. Yeah, and then also, you know, having proof that you had shows, you had tests where you were extremely nervous and it worked yeah. out. You know, I. You know, this is all a different here when you have an individual competition versus a team competition. This is much, much more relaxing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> Not that it's much calmer. Yeah? But in Tokyo, I knew exactly what was at stake. Yeah. 
you know. So, of course, I was more nervous at that time, you know, but it didn't affect my decisions that I made in the arena. Yeah. And that was a tremendous learning experience that you say, okay, you are way up here as yeah. far as anxiety goes, but it, um, it didn't affect your performance, possibly enhance it a little bit. Yeah. You know? And I've worked with enough um, uh, sports psychologists where they show at a certain level of anxiety that it's clearly enhancing. Yeah, if you're too calm, not so good. If it goes over the top, of course, not even. Yeah. yeah, but there has to be that certain level. And you know, once in a while, just for fun, I check my heart rate when I get on Mopsy. It's well around 100, 110. And I start walking in, it's at, at 80 or 90. So once I'm on the horse, you know, I start calming down. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. So cool to hear your perspective and the behind the scenes. So what do we have to look forward to tomorrow for the freestyle? <laughs> well, you know, this Mopsy and I have a big reputation to live up to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> The crib walker. I don't know if you guys saw the, the TikTok. The crib walking and the, the rain the horse. The In fact, when we came back from Tokyo, um, the lady named Sarah called me up. She was Sarah. She said, Stefan, do you know who this is? I said, no, I have no clue. It's Sarah, um, I'm um, the manager of Kevin Hart. Ah. And we'd love to find a way to get Mopsy and you into the studio at Burbank. Uh, true, true story. And uh, possibly have Kevin Hart, yeah. just, you know, sit on Mopsy. I said, listen, that's perfectly fine with me, but do me a favor, give your insurance a call because yeah. I, don't, I don't think that might fly in. Yes, it didn't. Uh, but the neat thing was just that, you know, Kevin and uh, Snoop Dogg, and, uh, you know, made a comment about dressage and brought it into the line. That's great. So, you know, talking about the um, the freestyle tomorrow night, there, there is a little surprise at the end. So we did change it. The last 10 seconds are different. And so far, I've only shared it with uh, Shannon because I didn't want anybody to talk me out of it. I was just afraid it's like so different and so interesting. You know, I just wanted to keep that to myself. It works out great. If not, that's okay too. It's kind of a fun, humorous thing. And I think in general, you know, especially for me, I took this sport and in general my life way too serious, honestly. And, you know, just learning to lighten up and going a little bit more with the flow of life has been much, much more productive. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. You're definitely an inspiration, I think, to many of us, and we really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. One more thing I want to share with you. One more thing I want to, want to share with you very quickly. You did what I tell my teammates before they go in the ring. I usually tell them, Write your ass off and don't F it up.
rode her and rode her and rode her and got her used to the arena. So I was really proud of how much more calm she was this World Cup compared to last World Cup. Um, so I was really, really proud of our preparation. And of course, Gunter's there to like hold my hand the whole way. Thank God for him. Um, and like her massage is my favorite thing to ride. I think she always shows that off well. And then her canter was clean. I was just proud of a clean test because she's really hot. She gets really tense, and then when they tighten in their back, it's easy to lose the movements, especially like her canter work. And just the fact that she had a clean test, I was like, that was our goal. Our goal is to hopefully squeak into the top 10, and she did that, so I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, it was a beautiful ride, and you have like such harmony and partnership with her. It's really, really fun to see. Um, so, how do you like? You talked about your preparation. How do you prepare in the warm up, and then also mentally? I don't know why I'm doing this. Mentally before a big show. Yeah. So for big shows, I've learned to basically mentally make it a small show. So I'm either in the stables with Eva or I'm in my hotel room. I don't. I didn't even look up. I haven't looked up into the stands yet. <laughs> so far. I don't even know what the stadium looks like. Um, I try to just make it like a home show, like I'm back at Thermal. Um, I don't look around. I don't talk to a lot of people um, in between the tests and everything. And. You just try and make it as normal and as familiar as possible. And then for Diva, she just gets out over and over and over and over and over. I mean, she's been in that arena more than any other horse in the World Cup, I swear. <laughs> she, we got her out so many times. But that's what she needs. Like, you have to know your horse, and then you have to know how to prepare them, and then know what to give them. And um, yeah, we had my whole team that I was bringing to World Cup, we had them all come out last Wednesday. So the vets, um, like Gunter, my parents, uh, sponsored anybody who is coming to World Cup. We've had them at our home stables for a week, so we've been preparing exactly how we would be here at home. So basically, nothing's changed for her because that's homegirl likes consistency. <laughs> so you gotta keep everything the same. You gotta, she's gotta know what's going on. And I understand. I'm like her. I wasn't. Um, I never had a mare before her, and then once I understood mares are just like me, I got her. <laughs> Just consistency and then making sure she's comfortable, that's the most important thing, and feel it, making it feel like it's a show at home is what I've been trying to do. Yeah, cool, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and then mentally, how do you prepare? Like, do you visualize your test, or what are some tips you can give people for preparing for the competition? I am not the most organized person in the world, so I have to be extremely organized in my preparation. So I've probably watched my videos of my whole season 7,000 times, and I, I do, I visualize the test a lot. I visualize it going perfectly, but I also visualize it going wrong at every single movement, and what I'm gonna do to fix every single movement. Because most of the time, that's what's gonna happen. <laughs> you're, you're in there fixing the mistakes, you're in there trying to avoid disasters, you're in there, I mean, I can't, it's hard to even explain how difficult they get in there and how you are just crash correcting the whole time, <laughs> but making it look like you're perfect and happy. <laughs> it's real, real, real hard. But um, yeah, I, mentally, I just, thankfully I've been here, so it's helped me to prepare for how hard it will be. I think as hard as you think it's gonna be, plan for it to be harder, plan for it to be more difficult, um, and then just keep it very focused and whatever your rhythm is at home, take that to the show. Yeah, those are good tips. And it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's so true, like you go in the ring and it always looks better than it feels, but everything that will go wrong can go wrong in the show ring. And, and that's normal, you know, it's normal that what you have at home is like 10% better than what you go and get in the show ring. And so that's just important to, like for all of us to keep in mind and be realistic about that and visualize the good and the bad. Um, so you missed our lecture on rider position, but your position is amazing. Like your seat and your legs and you're so quiet and subtle. So what is your secret to having such a nice position? And the first is Gunter Seidel <laughs> drilling me for the last seven years. Um, I think, again, like everything comes from your seat. Everything I'm able to do, why I think, because um, Steve is not the fanciest horse here, and she's not the biggest mover, but our harmony is 
a big reason why we're here and able to have success. And that really all comes from your seat. And um, really, I think like having supple hips, that's kind of a weird word. But yeah, moving, moving with your horse, not moving against your horse, listening to your horse is a huge one too. Because a lot of times um, you'll be like, okay, I need my horse to be more bent right now. And that's what you need to get to eventually. But right now, you have to like feel and ease your horse into being bent, or feel your horse into sitting more. Instead of like making it happen in two steps, make it happen in two circles. Instead of making it happen on one long side, make it happen in two rounds. And then you build your horse into the suppleness, into the contact, and everything. But everything, again, is like from your seat and your leg, and then your hands kind of relay the message. And that connection from like, your seat, your leg, to your elbow, to your hand, to their mouth, is everything I'm trying to create the whole time. And you don't keep it the whole time. I think that sometimes we stress when we lose that connection, you're like, I lost the horse for a second, it doesn't feel good. Like, don't panic in that moment. Just sit quiet, sit in, elbows in, heels down. My goodness, a million times I've heard that. <laughs> don't panic, and keep your position the same, so when your horse gets difficult, they come back to your position. Instead of us losing the position, Maybe getting the horse a little bit better for a second, but then you lose them again because you're yeah. wonky. So, um, yeah, I mean, literally the amount of times I'm just told heels down, elbows in, chin up, hands together. I mean, literally, oh, that, that's it. That's where it comes from. It's the fundamentals. It's the foundation over and over and over. There's no different way to do it. There's no other secrets. It's the fundamentals and then building on that over and over. Yeah, yeah. It's good to hear all of that because, you know, we're all still working on our position. And and also, you know, you think about Anna and we watched her ride yesterday. It's so beautiful, but she's still working on her position. She still needs reminders. So it's not something that you're done with. And I loved how you said, and I think it's so important to remember that your corrections always have to be within the rhythm of the horse because you're on a moving creature. And if we think about the training scale, Rhythm is the base of the training scale. So even if something's not perfect, like Anna said, you can't just like pull your horse and like immediately do it. You always have to think about like the rhythm and the movement and the fluidity and then go into that. Um, so I have to ask you about your fitness. Anna, if you guys follow her on Instagram, she's like the fitness queen. She like does like backflips off of trees and like crazy stuff. Um, so what's your fitness routine for your ride? So I don't do that every day. <laughs> and I wouldn't encourage you to do it either. No backflips. But um, for me, I got this horse named Sunday Boy when I was 18 years old. And he was a young rider. He was to do young rider stuff, but he was a Grand Prix horse. And what I realized is that I was not fit enough to do him justice. And I never wanted to feel that again. It fired me up so much. So I hit the gym and the good thing about fitness, I mean, with YouTube, with Instagram, with TikTok, you can find free fitness, any plan, any goal you want to hit at any time. So there's really no excuses. You can do body weight if you don't have a gym. If you have injuries, there's ways to work around that because I have a ton of injuries as well. Um, so my fitness plan at home, I work out hard, like four days a week, and then um, I'll do like something active recovery the rest of the day. So I love hiking. I get to live by the beach, which is really nice. So we go take walks on the beach, we go hiking. Um, you really have to listen to your body. You have to make a good plan for you. Everybody's individual. But I would say that I would not be here, and I would not be the rider that I am without the fitness that I have, especially if you want to be a top rider. There's no way to do a Grand Prix. I mean, if you don't want to throw up by your walk break, you're doing it wrong. It's my rule. <laughs> so, and, and we're already fit doing this, you know? And like Stefan, he's he's at work me. Gunter, he's in the gym more than I am sometimes. So it's like, it doesn't stop, it keeps going. And all the top riders I've ever met have good fitness, good um, nutrition. And it's, for me, I do not know how I would be able to ride the horses I ride without the fitness that I have. And also to, to buy the horses that I've bought. Like there are some that are, I have a couple horses that are considered like men's horses. They're very strong, very opinionated, very difficult for a girl to ride. And I would not be able to ride them and have the opportunity that I have on them without the fitness that I have. So you create a better life for yourself, but also you open way more opportunities for your riding and your career with your fitness level.
Okay, so Tamara Freestyle, what do we have to look forward to? Oh my gosh. Um, the freestyle is my favorite thing in the entire world. I'm also a musician, I'm a singer, I'm a worship leader, so music is my other passion, and the fact that we get to put music and horses together is unbelievable. I love it. So, um, last year, I went to see Top Gun Maverick with my family, and we were just sitting at the end with tears in our eyes, and I was like, this is it. <laughs> That's my freestyle. And um, we went to go see it seven more times <laughs> in like two weeks. And uh, yeah, we're just in love with it. And also like my grandfather um, was in the Air Force. My brother's in the military. I have a ton of military influence in my family. And um, I wanted to you know, really represent America and in hopes of going to Omaha to have a really patriotic freestyle for everybody. I mean, what's more Top Gun? Or what's more American than Top Gun, you know? So, for you guys who supported us my whole career and, and uh, have been such incredible fans. So it's, we really put together a story with the freestyle. Usually you don't go for too many songs. You go like four to five songs maybe for a freestyle. We have four songs just in the canner work. So, oh yeah, we went for it. So, um, but it's, by the end, you kind of feel like you've seen the movie a little bit throughout the freestyle, which I love. I wanted to like tell a story. I wanted the whole thing to be there. Um, it's very, we took some artistic chances that the judges have thankfully liked. Um, and then I get to sing in the middle, which is always fun. So it's a way to, to make it unique, um, which I love. And yeah, we just wanted to be, be Team America, Go America. And like, it's even more special because my, my grandfather, who kind of inspired um, all of my family to go into the military while I'm doing freestyle, he passed away from cancer last year. And it was the last thing I got to show him was this freestyle. So, Well, we'll all be cheering you on, and I'm really looking forward to your freestyle. So thank you so much for coming. I know you've been so busy. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. I know what it's like to have jobs and be out here, so I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's so fun to hear from the riders. It's, yeah, it's really special. And it's so nice, I think, too, to understand that, you know, they're out there, they're the best in the world, and they're still going through the same stuff that we are, you know, focusing on the basics working on their position, enjoying their horses. Every horse has a different personality and figuring out what works for your horse. 